Income Tax 2020, Practice Problem 1, Part 4, Data Input for Form 1099-DIV, 1099-Dividends, and Form 1099-INT, 1099-Interest. Come in, relax with Income Tax 2020. Here we are in our Lacert Tax software. You don't need the Lacert Tax software to follow along. However, I do think they have a 30-day free trial. So if you can get access to a promotional or demo version of it, it could be a good tool to practice with. We're going to be continuing on with our practice problem recap of what has happened in the prior presentations, which if you have not seen, you might want to go back and take a look at that. But we'll just do a recap here and we're going to move on then to the dividends and the interest. Our goal to basically put all this information that we kind of focused in on individually into one tax return so we can see how the com compilation of all the stuff together can complicate things a bit and how to deal with that uh, all the forms at one time. So then uh, in prior presentations, we took a look at our data that we might get, say, from a client or for gathering our own information. We have it all basically in the PDF formats. We then sorted it in our Adobe Reader in the format that we believe will be uh, the best way to enter the data. We already entered the W-2 information, and then so that is no longer up here, and that W-2 information was something that we then used to populate some of the starting point of the tax return, including like uh, the social security number and the address if we did not have that, and then the uh, marital status we would get. We can kind of guess that from the W-2 information, but we would also get it from the prior year tax return and our questionnaire with the tax return if we have any changes from uh, tax period to tax period. So thus far, we have the 80000 in the wages from the W-2s, and that's all we've done for the data input. We're focusing in on the income side of things. This time, we're going to be talking about the dividends and the interest. So dividends and interest. Now, when you look at the dividends and interest, these are going to be types of statements that will typically come from possibly like tied in with the bank and the brokerage accounts and whatnot. And the problem with them is that the format of the interest and dividend statements might look a little bit differently because say you might get them, say if you have a, a uh, account with something like an E-Trade or Vanguard or something like that, then you might have you know dividends and interest and you could have capital gains all at one time from the same institution. And they'll basically put all the, the you know, the 1099 information into one document. So the, the boxes for the 1099 forms will still be the same. You can go to the instructions if you have any questions with them and whatnot. But if you have someone who has substantial investments, and especially if they trade stocks, it could be a little confusing just to sort your documents. Why? Because... You know, it would ni it'd be nice to enter all the interest in separately, right? I'd like to put all my interest 1099s here, which we did in our, our mock problem, and then have all the dividend 1099s so I can check those separately, and then have all the capital gain 1099s be separated, and then have the, the 1099s related to trades like stock trades be separated so I can do those things one at a time. But again, it's a little bit difficult to organize our data in that way because some of our forms might have multiple of those things uh, along with it or included with it so just kind of keep that in mind that's why i typically will do the interest first because it's less it's the least likely to be tied in with stock sales and dividend type of income and then i'll go to the dividend income which is which is quite likely tied into any kind of stock sales as well so when i do these kind of together they might be kind of tied together here but for this one, we're going to go dividend, we're going to go interest income, dividend income, then we'll talk about trades of stock uh, trades and capital gains for stock trades in a future presentation. Now, once you have the interest, if it's just a straight interest from the bank or something like that, then it's usually a fairly basic form. It's going to be pretty easy uh, to do the data input for it. So we just got kind of a, a, a mock W a mock form here for the 1099 uh, interest form. And in box one, we have the interest here. Now it gets a little bit more confusing if you've got something in say, uh, interest that's not taxable or, or uh, tax exempt interest that we have down here, but still fairly easy to, uh, to set up for that. So we're gonna just do the data input. So let's go back on over. I'm gonna go into the forms. I'm gonna go interest. So now we want interest income. And I think we just called it bank one. So bank one. And then we have this, whether it be the taxpayer or the spouse. So I think this first one was the taxpayer. So I'm going to assign it out to the to the proper person here. And then we're going to say that the it was 670 for box one. So 670 for box one. And then we had 
tax exempt down here in box eight for the 150. So that's gonna be the 150. So tax exempt interest, I'm gonna put the 150 here. Now, if I, if I pull this over, then I'm gonna bring that on over to the forms and see what we have then. We've got now the 80,000 plus now the 670. We don't have a separate schedule, which would be then the schedule B. I mean, you can you could find it here in the software, there it is. But it's not something that's mandatory at this point in time because uh, we're not over the threshold, which I believe is 1,500. So we just have this worksheet here telling us the added information. So there's the added information. And so there's gonna be the interest. And then let's, and then obviously this information this 670 is the taxable portion. Then we have the informational portion going over here in 2A of the 150. And that's just telling the IRS, hey, we got this 150 that's tax exempt, but it's not being included in the calculation of the taxable income and therefore no tax is gonna be on it. It's kind of an informational uh, type type of item. So when we put this in our, like a, in our Excel worksheet, we're basically not gonna include the 150 in our, in our tax calculation because it's not gonna be part of our taxable income. Uh, even though we just kind of report it here. So then we have the second one. So I'm going to go to the second one here. So the we had the bank interest. So I'm just going to, this was bank two. So we're going to say, all right, let's go back on over to bank two. We'll go to our data input and say we add another one. And this is going to be bank number two. And it was for, this is for the spouse. Uh, so I'm going to assign that out like we're properly supposed to. And then that's going to be 710. So I'm going to say 710 for that one. And we don't have any uh, other other interest. So we're just taking that from box one. Nothing else down here. So that looks good. And so I'm going to say OK and pull that back on over. So now we have the uh, 1,380. We still don't have enough to be, be needing the Schedule B. It's going to be in this worksheet with the two items here. And then if we had the Schedule B, to, to back that up, this would be, if we had something over the 1,500, uh, then we would be requiring the Schedule B, which would have this information lined up over here. And so I'm gonna go back to the 1040. I'm just gonna show the forms that we need. So that's gonna be that per fairly straightforward on the interest. And then we're gonna go to the dividends. So again, the dividends might be coming from your broker and they might not look exactly like this, but the boxes will still line up and if you have questions on a particular box, then you can, uh, you know, go to the instructions. And if they don't have the instructions and the forms provided to you by like the client, then you can look them up on the IRS website. Just look up this form, scroll down till you get to the instructions on the form, and it'll give you the box by box, blow by blow instructions. Okay, so then we're going to go to the dividends. So dividends, so I'm going to go back on over, going to go to income, I'm going to say now we want the dividends. And the first one was for E-Trade. So this is going to be E-Trade. E-Trade dividends. I believe this is for the taxpayer. And this is where we got the ordinary and the other. So ordinary dividends is going to be 1,000. So 1,000 on the ordinary. And then the other di and the others 800 qualified dividends. So that doesn't mean that we have uh, 1,800 dividends. That means we have of the 1,000 dividends, we have 800 that are qualified and therefore could have a preferential tax rate other than the ordinary income tax rate. That's why that's the case. Now, then we also have this kind of confusing thing down here where it's got a total capital gain distribution. And basically what that means generally is that, that there was a distribution that was kind of like a dividend, but it cut into maybe the investments uh, rather, like, rather than coming out of retained earnings. And so basically you got to record it as a capital gain then, but you're not going to record it on schedule D. You're going to record it. Well, you're going to record it in terms of the data input in this field, but it's going to, it might complicate things when you, when you pull it over into the form, because then it, then it may pull over into basically in, a, in another area. It's not going to be a dividend, even though it's on the 1099 dividend form. And we're going to put it in the 1099 di dividend input screen. In other words, because it's going to be a capital gain in essence. So let's check that out. So if I go back on over to the forms, we're going to say, all right. So now we got the dividends of the 1,000 uh, here. Of that 1,000, 800 of them are qualified. So the whole 1,000 is going to be included in the taxable income down below. But then when we apply the tax, uh, calculating the tax, we actually have to do a separate tax calculation other than 
the progressive tax rate on the 800 because it's going to be not taxed at the at the same progressive rate but a different progressive rate because it, they're qualified dividends so again the tax calculation has now become more complex we want to be able to explain that to a client but we probably aren't going to do the tax calculation to kind of double check and i'm going to depend on this on the software in essence to do that calcul that calculation in the progressive tax calculation so uh, we'll see we'll see that shortly so then we got the e-trade there's the 1000 we we would then this would also be supported by the schedule b but it's not being done thus far because once again we don't have so the second part of schedule b here's e-trade it's not populated because we're not over the 1500 yet so that's going to be that and then this 300 is popping down here in the capital gains so it's down here in the capital gains which is kind of funny right that kind of <laughs> because it was on the dividend form instead of us like doing a stock trade type of form but it's going to be down here in the capital gains area and so there we have that and we'll see it again when we do do the schedule d information if i do go down uh, to the schedule d this is where we're going to calculate the gains and losses on sales and you can see this 300 down here in the capital gain distributions so this this kind of comp kind of it's a little bit funny it's a strange place for it to be in essence because it it was input on the 1099 div uh, form and, and again it's because it's kind of a distribution that cut into to the, to the investments you could think of it basically instead of the retained earnings it didn't qualify for a dividend but rather was a return of investment or something like that and therefore had to be calculated uh, as a capital gain so we need to note that when we do the data input and just kind of be aware of that so it doesn't confuse us when we start to double check our information so then i'm going to go back on over and say all right well what else do we got then we got the second one let's do the next one this is going to be the 1099 dividend from vanguard vanguard so i'm going to go back on over and we're going to say we have another one from van let's see vanguard that's a b should be a v vanguard i don't think my fingers were in the right this is going to be for two because it's the spouse and we're going to say this is going to be for 750 750 and of that 750 i think it said 500 was uh was qualified so 500 qualified 750 500 qualified and this is for jane spouse so I think that's all we need here. You can see the totals down below. So you can kind of do a double check down here. And then we're going to go back on over and say, all right. Now that pushed us over the limit because now we're over the 1,500. So schedule B is now boldened and boldened because now that uh, we're going to have that one here. Now that this 1,750 is now total dividends of that 1,750 between the two dividends, uh, 1099 divs, 1,300 are the qualified portion. And then we've got our, our capital gain. Also note, again, that capital gain, because it's a capital gain, will also be taxed possibly at different progressive tax rates. So although it's included down here in taxable income, now we have you know this amount that's included down here and this amount that's included down here, both of which will be taxed at a, some progressive tax rate, which will be different, uh, most likely, than the progressive tax rate being calculated on the rest of the income that's part of this 83 4, 430. So again, if the tax calculation, which actually happens basically on page two, has just become a whole lot more complex. It was already complex because we just ordinary income has a progressive tax system, but now we have capital gains, which are taxed at different rates, and ordinary dividends. So again, we're going to basically depend on the software to kind of do this calculation right there. But when you, when you talk to clients and stuff and they're like, well, why does it even matter that you have this over here and this capital gains? And it's because, well, there are different tax rates that are going to be applied to it. You're getting favorable tax rates typically for capital gains usually and if it's long term and the qualified dividends. And that's all being done, you know, here when, when, you, do the calc when you do the tax calculation on that. And we're kind of dependent on the software to do that, to do that calculation. Okay, so those are going to be that. And then the Schedule B has now shown up here. So now we have the Schedule B, which is mandatory because this amount for the dividends is now over the 1,500 threshold. So we have these two items on Schedule B, which are now feeding over into the first page. And we no longer have like that worksheet that was popping up here because we got the full Schedule B 
now popping up. So one recap, we got the 80,000 W-2 income from the two W-2 incomes from the prior presentation. We've got the uh, the interest of the 1,380, then 150 of the, uh, of interest was was uh, tax exempt. That doesn't mean that that uh, of this 1,380, 150 was tax exempt. It means we had 1,380 of interest and another 150 of interest that was that this amount was tax exempt. Whereas on the dividends, we had 1,750 total dividends. And for this one, we're saying 1,300 of those dividends were qualified dividends and therefore possibly taxable at a, at a favorable rate. We've got the 300 capital gains, which will possibly, which will probably be taxable at a favorable capital gains rate. That gives us our total income of the 83,430, and that pulls down to the uh, adjusted gross income because there's no above the line adjustments of the 83,430. We've got the standard deduction at the 24,800, which is for the married filing joint standard deduction. We're not itemizing. In other words, that pulls down here and, and we then have the taxable income at the 58,630. That's the main thing that we can check at this point in time, as well as we can check the payments that are happening on page two. The payments down here, the 800, those were on the W-2s. And then I probably wouldn't be checking the tax calculation each time, but be dependent on the software to some degree. And then, and then I'll go back and basically check that at the end of, of the process to see that that looks reasonable within the range. So that's what we got so far. So next time we'll enter the same information into basically our Excel worksheet and see how we can kind of double check that by entering it into the, the two sources.